There it is. There it is. Awesome. All right, my brother. Excellent. Thank you for uh, joining today. No problem. No problem at all. Awesome. Pleasure. Pleasure. We got uh, Robert Fanara, and before we get into the interview, I got to ask, what what, yes. fabulous, what fabulous dish did you uh, make for us today? You've been teasing us on your Instagram with all these amazing dishes. Getting us. My home. God, I <laughs> I made some stuffed peppers, peppers. and they were sensational. It was since Italian stuffed peppers. I can't claim credit all the way because Chef Lydia. One of my favorite chefs, I got it from the internet. I get a lot of the ones from the internet. I really don't create them on my own. Some of them I do create on my own. But that one I got from uh, her. Uh, and it was excellent. Most excellent uh, recipe. Yeah, I guess. Of course, I use, I'm a little partial to Rayo's sauce. The Rayo's, I'm not plugging Rayo's because they sold the, the business for like, I think, uh, a lot of money. Uh, but I knew Frank Pellegrino. We did a play together, Frankie Rayo. And, um, I love the penne vodka sauce. So I pour that over them and then I pressure cook them a little bit. And they were just great, my brother. <laughs> we, we didn't know that, uh, you know, in the times that we didn't see Eugene on screen that he was actually secretly working at Vesuvio's this whole time. We didn't know. Yes, yes. On that. Eugene is a man of many traits. Yeah. And he gets to talk another, live another day. How about that, huh? And Robert, are you, based, are you based in uh, New York or New Jersey? Where, where are you? Uh... Based in New York. I'm based in New York City. Um, I do most of my work here. If something happens, uh, California happens, I would work there, but it would have to be something that would pull me out for a reason. You know what I mean? I have worked in Canada. I did a little, not, I really haven't done any much filming, much filming in California. For the, uh, for the fans that are, uh, you know, kind of sitting under a rock, uh, we've got Robert Fanara, who's very famously known um, for playing uh, four seasons on the show, The Sopranos. I think it was seasons three, four, five, and six. And Correct. Uh, you also did a season on uh, vinyl, a little reunion with Terrence Winter and uh, Martin Scorsese. Um, so that was yes. so got a chance to work. That was a lot of fun. I, I thought that was going to be a real hit, but uh, music is a very difficult. Uh, there's a lot of experts when it comes to music, and people have their opinions. And it's, the story is so broad in terms of the corruption of music. I mean, if you want to talk about that a little bit, I'll talk about it. You know? Yeah, absolutely. That was an awesome show. The, vinyl, the, 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 the root of vinyl came from Mick Jagger who was one of the producers, his son uh, was on the show. Uh, I think it's Luke Jagger. I think his name is Luke and really nice, nice play one of the, uh, one of the main characters. And um, that idea came from somewhat like uh, Tommy James and the Shondells with Morris Levy, the corrupt uh, music producers who kind of raped the uh, artists, made them sign through the, through the, uh, who I played, the Underworld, La Cosa Nostra, who produced, uh, you know, produced under the table these artists and forced them to sign contracts, which is one of my first scenes. Um, it was forcing an artist to, to sign a contract with uh, a fellow actor, Armin Garrow, who played Galasso. And uh, so this, this journey, Term of this idea came from that, and of course, um, I thought it was going well, but I heard rumors that a little bit too more fo too much focused on the um, drugs than it was on the music. Um, the corruption was okay, but the drugs, and of course, the society has um, labeled. Drugs is not like the 60s was hallucinogenic drugs to get people to a different place. And, and, and it's become a, a look at um, that company today that was sued for all those millions of dollars. So it's not really a popular subject. So I was told that it was a little bit more too focused on the drug uh, uh, aspect of it. You know, but I thought that the, um, it had some valid points too. I also think that 
um, one of the good things to do would be to have brought in maybe Stevie Van Zandt, Stevie to, to, to uh, as a consultant, although I really can't question Warren Scorsese or Mick Jagger. They're experts at what they do too, so who knows the formula, you know? That's yeah. a little, little, little tidbit. Yeah. Were there ever talks of uh, maybe turning it into a, a TV movie? Because I know it, was, it ended back in sixteen, seventeen. Have they ever thought about bringing it back for a movie? I haven't heard um, that. I have not heard that. Um, it could have been. Yeah. Um, let, let's face it. Um, the whole and now with everything going on with the COVID thing, everybody is is uh, gathering together in these cocoons. Yeah. And people are gathering together in, in network cocoons like HBO and Hulu and Showtime and Netflix, especially. Uh, Apple is producing, Apple TV is producing, everyone's producing. Because if you're a director, you'd like to tell the story. I think that was a way of telling the whole story. It just couldn't be told in a two hour film unless it's, it was formulaic in a certain way. There's been the musical films like Prince's Purple Rain, which had somewhat of a, was probably the first great mu uh, musical film, you know, rock and roll film. They're, they're a little bit tricky. The, the Pretenders was one, you know, so, you know, I mean, the idea I suppose was to broaden it into a series. Now, if they were thinking about Terry, Terrence Winter, from Sopran Terry, I, I don't think he had the idea of, uh, and who does, you know, not so many people write like that anymore. They're, they're writing more. I mean, look at The Irishman, you know, about a three hour film. It's hard to tell the story. Some people say, well, they should have broken into, it's so long they could have broken it into a, into a, into a three part series or something like that. Oh no, I mean, cause that's Marty's vision is to be one film. It's like Led Zeppelin's 10 minute song. You know, if you're having a good time, why, uh, you know, Casino was like that. It's long, but it was enjoyable. Yeah. I think people are really appreciate Irish, appreciate Irishman a little bit more love five the, years from now. Love that movie. Yeah, thank you. Lo loved your part in that movie as well, too. I want to I dive into uh, The Irishman, um, but I'm, I think I'm going to save that for, okay. for, for the end. Um, I guess maybe, uh, Robert, just kind of going back to how everything uh, started out, you know, kind of what got you into acting? I think one of your earlier TV shows was Law and Order, right before you got onto Sopranos. So, uh, what inspired you to get into acting? Well, the initial inspiration was my uncle, who, God rest his soul, Father Joseph. He he he, he um, created um, a bunch of players in Howard Beach, where John Gotti hung out. Wow. No, 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 no affiliation. Oh, okay, just making sure. Uh, but that's where he started. That's where he started his company, Grecian Players, and he built it up to, to, for, you know, as a priest to, 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 he was great at raising funds, and he built up the, the Grecian Players to, to do very big productions, musicals of, uh, the Music Man. Um, Hello, Dolly. And he, in some cases, he would invite some of the writers who wrote the book or some of the musical people. And he had an orchestra and, and it built from there. And, and as a young man, I, my father, of course, being his brother, would take me to see with my mom and my family to see his place. So it became a ritual every year we would see his place. And I kind of got the bug from him. And uh, it really was... I guess I'm a middle child, always wanting attention and stuff. And you know, not want, you know what I mean? You know, when you're a middle child, you don't get the fringe benefits of being the first. So I guess, I guess I got the bug because of that. And and, and then, you know, I um, the first professional job I had it, it was Sopranos, and then of course the Law and Order. But Sopranos was my first professional TV job. Awesome. And by season three, um, I mean, the show had already established its footprint. I know when season one came out, I mean, no one really knew what it was all about. Um, you know, just kind of listening to some of the interviews with some of the cast, like uh, some of the cast thought it was like a orchestra show and just they thought it was like a comedy. So by season two, I mean, which I think season one was filmed in 97 and then 
99 is when season one came out. By the time you joined, I mean, it was yeah. already kind of established. Um, was it hard to, uh, to get the role? Was there any added pressure because of uh, kind of the reputation that Sopranos had already built? Sometimes they, I guess the best way to describe that is, um, I think in the military during World War II, when they, when they were doing paratrooper training, they said your first jump is going to be okay. You're going to be okay in your first jump. <laughs> and then it gets a little tricky, the second jump and the third jump. So this was my first jump. Yeah. So I didn't really know a lot. Uh, as much as a lot of the other players, James especially, had a lot more experience than I did. But he was my good friend, and he asked me to, uh, to audition for, for, the, for Eugene. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so that in itself was a challenge. Uh, main, like, it, it's almost like a lion that, or uh, I think uh, leopards are like that. They, they kill their prey, and then they have to take their prey up to the topmost tree and hold on to it because there's a lot of different prey, uh, prey animals that steal it from them. So people think that they're under the impression that uh, you get a part and uh, well, you, you've made it and but you have to maintain it. You have to give it a level of uh, the best the best shot. In my case, it was the first professional job. So that was more rough than getting the part. The, getting the part was a lot easier. My auditions really went really well. So uh, I was maintaining it because of my lack of experience, film experience. It was, I've done, a, I did a lot of theater before that, but not film. And film is small. So I went on a crash course of learning how to, how to uh, act for film. I, I, um, uh, a good friend of mine, Steve Schripper from the show, he suggested Michael Caine's video on film acting, which was very, very helpful. Uh, so there's people along the way that helped out. Steve was one of them. And also James himself. Uh, James would always give me uh, um, tips on how to deal with things. You can't give a tip on how to deal with pressure, but that's you're either going to deal with it, and you, everyone deals with it in their own way, you know? But uh, I, had, I had a lot of support. I mean, it was a great opportunity. I did a lot of praying too, and um, I made it through. And I'm really happy with the, my last episode. Oh, yeah. So. And, and also, too, because originally, you know, your role um, was brought on as a small part, and then it just grew each season. And it was awesome because, I mean, within the first few episodes, you were already getting made with, uh, with Christopher. And um, so we, yeah. we knew, um, or at least, you know, you, you kind of cemented yourself. I don't think they would have made you if they didn't think that, you know, this role would, uh, would grow. And um, it was awesome yeah. because you, you also worked, at, well, at, in the show at least, you know, there was uh, three different capos that you had. You know, originally it was Gigi, and then it was Ralphie, and then Vito. And it seemed like the last season was kind of your push. You know, you were, you were right there to kind of to get that. Right. Well, I'll tell you, Zia, um, you have that biblical name, huh? That's a great name to have. Thank you. It's a very good name. Thank you. You're welcome. I will be honest with you, and I'll be honest for all the other actors out there that perhaps it might happen to them. Um, I, I was um, given the role of Ralph Seferetto originally. So Joe Pantaleone's role, I was given that role, I signed the contract for the role. But it really wasn't working out between me and James. I don't think David really liked the chemistry between us both. And I think it was a little bit of my inexperience also, honestly. But, I mean, James liked me so much and so did David. He kept me on the show and uh, I had a good uh, godfather, you know, James. And sometimes I believe he really was the one to say, I want Bobby to stay on the show. And, uh, you know, one of the first years in um, David Chase, he's like a leprechaun. He came up to me and he said, so what are you going to do after this, uh, this season? You know, I was Eugene. I said, well, I'm, I, plan on, I plan on being Eugene. And he just smiled. And um, I stayed on. And uh, I waited patiently. And um, 
I was re rewarded uh, with a great episode. Um, it was tough at first, but you know, it worked out okay. There's a lot of juxtapose, a lot of competition, and it's, you know, but not on Sopranos. But you always want to be the best you can be. So there's a lot of questioning. I think when you first start out professionally, you have a lot of questions, and then you just don't care. I remember James telling me uh, during members only, see, how's it going? I said, it's going really good. He says, you don't give a shit anymore, right? I said, no, nah, I really don't give a shit anymore. It's good that now you're really acting. <laughs> you're really acting now so you don't give a shit anymore <laughs> you don't care about all these ins and outs is my hair right or did i say that right uh, more experience you know it uh it strengthens you but that's life yeah we're all strengthened this crisis will strengthen us i believe it'll strengthen us today zia zaya zaya or zia yeah, it's Zion. pronounced uh, just like Isaiah, but with no I. So don't worry, I, I get it mispronounced so all the time. Yeah. Zaya, Zaya. Yeah. Zaya. Yeah. Right on, man. So that, you know, that's, that was my experience. And of course, along the way, I, got, I, I started booking on the downtime of Sopranos when we weren't shooting, which was like four or five months every year. I started booking uh, Law and Orders and stuff like that, which gave me a lot of confidence too. That I must be doing something right if I'm being if I'm booking these jobs. So that was really great to do those two. Working with my first was with Jerry Orbach, a wonderful musical, great theater actor. Um, that was a great experience to work with him. I had a great time. That's awesome. And although it was only maybe uh, I think it was one scene. We had one scene together. Again, jumping out of the parachute for the first yeah. time. It's always to your advantage. You're not thinking so much, you know, right? You know. Yeah, I'm sure you have, uh, you know, multiple, you know, favorite scenes that that you shot. My favorite scene with you was the scene in the uh, the construction site um, where you hit um, Paulie Jr. in the head with the glass bottle. That was just, that's one of my favorite scenes on there too. And then just Vito just goes in he goes, I heard it was someone over there that did that. And they just, the whole situation got broken up quick. And you could just see how like, you know, like they, the, you know, the family took care of its business inside, even though one of their guys is potentially dying on the floor. That was one of my favorites. Yes, that, uh, that's, this is true. What's your question? Sorry. On a, Go ahead. I, I was just sharing my, my favorite scene. Would love to get your thoughts on that scene, but what was your uh, favorite scene that, uh, that you shot? Oh, my favorite scene. I, I suppose my favorite scene I think my favorite scene uh, where I think I really was on is with, with Stevie Van Zandt when, I, when he told me the news that I wasn't going to be able to get out. I think there was a turmoil going on inside me that I think that that was a really good scene. I also like the scene with James that I had in his office when I asked him to get out. Uh, I thought that was a good scene. But the other one was a little bit more turmoil going on with Stevie. Yeah. Um, and that scene was, you know, it was good. And also, I mean, the whole, that whole episode, there was a lot of, well, you know, there was a lot of pressure, you know, now you finally have, it's not all about me, but I do carry a part of the episode on my back too, because it's messages for members only. And this is something that you can, you get your body and you can never get out. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's no way out. And I think for people like um, a lot of wise guys, you know, John Gotti got his soul too, you know, and there's a place for him. Also, I mean, it's tough life and it's hard to get out even when you are free. You're not truly free. Guys like Carlo Gambino, that was the, those were those are old days. Those were, were days of old. They were able to keep under the radar enough not to uh, be noticed. But it is not for me, that life. I mean, it's tough. It's, it's uh, serious. But that was my favorite scene, I suppose, with Steve, with Stevie. It was, yeah, it was very... And of course, I think the construction site, construction site scene was the fun, most fun scene I had. Those were fun. That was the most fun scene I had, smashing with the snapper bottle, you know? Yeah, yeah. 
No, the, 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 the last two episodes, um, you know, with you, I mean, they were very, very heavy. I mean, like I was initially, I remember when I was watching it, I was thinking that you were going to get sent as something bad was going to happen to you, but eventually you were going to get sent to Miami. Like maybe you would have lost your son or maybe I, I was thinking your son was going to commit suicide because he had the drug problem. Um, and I was, I was, you just, you wanted to see some sort of reward for him. I was, I was, I felt bad because uh, the pitch that you had given Tony uh, was so good. And it just, it just seemed like, you know, maybe, maybe somehow they were going to send you to, to Miami or Florida in Florida. And, uh, but then maybe you'd come back like the last episode and maybe they'd give a mission for you and maybe something would happen to you in 6B. Um, but it was very well um, played. Um, very good storyline, very Thank good you. ending, and um, yeah, I just I felt so bad. Well written, sure. Very well written, very well written. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you look, even look at the drug addiction, my son with the drug um, issues, the son, ahead of its time, the, uh, the, the 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 episode because later on, the oxycotton really got to a really bad level with people and, and youngsters taking it. Um, I mean, it, it affected a lot of people's lives. It affected my life in a personal way. When my nephew, I lost my nephew, Joseph, to uh, substance, uh, was doing so well, but uh, very hard thing to, uh, to fight. But, um, so yes, thank you, Isaiah. Um, so, I mean, you know, it, was, it had a lot of different uh, facets that were very interesting that episode. Terry was Terry Winter and David, well, mostly Terry, because he won the Emmy for Best Dramatic. He had a lot of, he, he really took the time. He took the time to uh, think about what was going on outside also, besides just the wise guys. Yeah. Um, Robert, I do want to shift to, because I Sopranos is my all-time favorite show. I can talk to you about Sopranos for yeah, sure. hours. But another one of my favorite shows is uh, Ray Donovan. And you were on the last uh, two seasons of Ray Donovan. Um, and the show just kind of, you know, ended, um, you know, rather, rather quickly. And um, what, what, were you, what, were you, what was your experience like on, uh, on the show? Because uh, you were, the, was it the lieutenant or the sergeant, uh, the role that you were playing? Uh, uh, the lieutenant. lieutenant uh, yeah. yeah. What, what, what was it like uh, working on uh, Ray Donovan? Well, it was, it was with, um, it was a great experience. Another, another good, nice bunch of people. Um, uh, the people I work with, you know, were really wonderful. Um, and um, Ray Donovan, the Shriver, uh, he, um, he's just a great, terrific actor. He just he knows it so well, you know. You know, sorry about that. That's uh, my phone. I'm going to shut, shut it down. No worries. So it yeah, Lee was, uh, I mean, we didn't have a lot. We only had a little bit. We had a little bit of scene, you know, not too much one-on-one -on -one together. But we did work one night together. And uh, you can see how his excellence, you know, he's the most excellent actor, you know, and uh, very, very on point. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was great. And of course, I was introduced with that, uh, who, uh, the, the Bernice, uh, her, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, I mean, she was great, you know. Awesome. And uh, the whole thing was a very good experience. I uh, wasn't really a big uh, Ray Donovan fan until I really started, um, got some work on it, you know. There's so much out there. Yeah. But I did, I did understand the show once I started doing it. I said, well, this is about like, to your, day, your, your greatest daydream. The great, your greatest daydream that someone does something to you and you exact revenge on them. You're able to get them back. And Ray Donovan was going to do that for you. And how many people want to do that? They want, they, you know, someone does something shitty to them and they just want to get back at them. You know, just or they try to, just someone tries to ruin them and they counter, and they counter, and they counter that. So, I mean, in that respect, an eye for an eye, I suppose it is, as they say, it's an eye for an eye kind of a show. So I think that's why people really like it. Is that why you like it? Yeah, I, I love the show. I mean, one, um, you know. You like it because its premise is basically Ray Donovan's going to solve your problem. 
Yeah, to fix and it. And that could be a, a bullshit problem that needs to be fixed, right? He was the fixer. He's a private detective. He's a fixer. He's a fixer, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Ori Spado. Uh, he's, he's known as the, uh, the Hollywood fixer, the, uh, the mob boss of Hollywood. Um, he, he was kind of connected with uh, the Columbos back in New York, and then uh, he moved to, uh, to Hollywood uh, in the 70s. Um, I actually just recently did an interview with him and also met him, but, but he um, has kind of spoken to some of the uh, creators on Ray Donovan and, um, and some, of the, some of the cast, I'm sorry. And, uh, but yeah, a lot of the stuff, he said some of the stuff may have been based on him as well, but um, that was kind of interesting, yeah. meeting someone kind of similar to, uh, to a Ray Donovan. Um, and uh, w what was your take on how the show uh, ended? Do you think uh, there's room for one more season or room for a TV movie on Showtime? I think, I, I, I think that there, I think that there is, I mean, I mean, for sure. I think that, you know, I think they were talking about it, right? Yeah. They were talking about it. And then all of a sudden this happened. Yeah. You know, I mean, so it was, you know, kind of kiboshed, right? You know, um, Quincy Tyler Bernstein, Quincy, very great actress, and she's on Ghost now. That that show, that that series called Ghost. Quincy Tyler Bernstein, she played the the my. Uh, uh, she was under my elite. Uh, I was her elite. You know, what I mean, um, she was a detective under my jurisdiction. Um, so I mean, I wasn't a really a big fan. I mean, now I am, but I wasn't like every season like Sopranos. So, yeah. I mean, I, I think that people deserved it. You know what I mean? Uh, they really wanted something bigger. And I think it was going to happen. You know, but, you know, Lee Schreiber, you know, you got to remember something about actors. They, um, they're doing something for quite some time. I mean, I never really worked at that level like James Gandolfini and Lee Schreiber. I never or worked at that level. I've worked at that level kind of in theater, you know, that you say, well, six weeks of this show, I want to move on. Um, now they're talking about how long was uh, Ray Donovan on for? Well, it had to be how many years? Uh, I thought it was seven or eight seasons. Seven, eight seasons. Yeah. You, you, you kind, of, kind of say as an actor, I'd like to do something else. I'm not so locked into that. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and, and maybe Lee had some other problems. I think he was doing something out in Europe. I'm not sure that yeah. was planned or just recently or something like that. Uh, uh, but maybe he had committed to some projects that he wanted to do. You know, he's a really great actor. He's a classical actor, too. I've seen him in Shakespeare in the Park, mm -hmm. where he played uh, 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 Iago to, yeah. to Othello. Yeah. And uh, he was terrific in that. Uh, I forget. And I really, you know, sometimes... You don't know what to do. Like you're on set and you're, and you're with, and you're not, you know, people are focusing, actors are focusing. You don't really want to break their concentration. Yeah. But if you get an opportunity to talk, you know, you, you might be able to slip something in. I was with that way with Denzel. There were regrets of not maybe talking to Denzel when I could have, when I had, we had the same acting coach, an American gangster. Yeah. Um, but that was years before, prior, you know, that he was not at that level then but uh, with leave i remember and chase Park, uh, uh elderly person this is great in new york was sleeping in the front row you know, geriatric and got old and, you know he's sleeping and and he's playing iago he's going through one of his big speeches and he just goes up to the person just gets him and i, I never forget it. it was so funny and the crowd laughed because that's where shakespeare is should be it's like improvisational also you got to remember there's a fourth wall, but it can be broken at times. I mean, you can't take yourself that seriously all the time because then you look ridiculous, you know? Yeah. So, you, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I didn't really follow it. So I couldn't tell you that, you know, like people wanted to see another season, you know? Yeah. And look, they wanted to see more, more, they wanted, they didn't like the ending of Sopranos. Is, is that it? You know, I, you know, same thing with that. Yeah. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts that, cause they're making a, a prequel movie. It was supposed to already be out by now. Um, but it uh, looks like it's coming out early next year. Uh, is there a yeah. part for young Eugene in there? Was, I think Eugene was part of the family. 
as a kid. Well, we played CYL basketball together. I'm not sure that I'm in there as a young man. I mean, there's, you know, there was no part for it in that for me. I mean, but uh, I'm not sure that uh, whether or not Eugene is being depicted in, in, in there. Um, um, that I don't know. I haven't really seen any of the previews. Some of the cast members have seen some. Uh, uh, some of the, you know, because the film has a process of germinating. You know, you have your first cut, like a writer's first draft. The same thing for the film. Writers do the same thing. They 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 take this, they put it there. And David Chase is just a genius and a perfectionist. That uh, you know, I'm sure he's going through it again and again, comb, find comb, uh, find to combing it, find to you know whatever that saying is. Yeah. And trying to perfect it and make it better. It's a prequel, yes, to before. Tony was Tony. Yeah. Um, just it has to do with the racial stuff, which is kind of topical right now because there's a lot of racial stuff going on. Black Lives Matter and stuff like that. A lot of the problems stem from that, from those times, this uh, lack of communication between the races and, and, uh, and uh, everyone taking sides. It's kind of scary, but uh, I guess we have to, I mean, in order to overcome it, we'll have to face it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think the timing of, uh, of The Many Saints of Newark is, is perfect. It, it would have been great if it came out uh, right now. I mean, I, I, mean we, I hope, you know, just for the sake of, you know, humanity, that things kind of get better um, soon. But um, I, I think it's still going to be in people's minds. So uh, definitely the timing um, of, of that because it's dealing with yeah. the race riots. And I actually have uh, some friends of mine that uh, kind of grew up uh, in Jersey during those times. I remember the race riots and, and gave me uh, kind of like a, a detailed description of it. And uh, it was it was harsh, really, really rough times. So. You know, about the racial riots, I had them in my school, black against white, you know, it happened in my school, yeah. my high school. I never part, part uh, you know, took part in them, but the seniors, uh, you know, I was kind of like, whoa, what the hell is going on here? You know what I mean? I, have, I don't hate anybody, so it's like, Whatever you grow up with a thing, it's a thinking. Yeah, you know, it's a thinking. Um, I did want to jump into uh, some of the film work that you did. You mentioned one of them, uh, American Gangster, and um, I, I was excited yeah. uh, because American Gangster came out after Sopranos. I think it was two thousand seven, two thousand eight when it came out, and um, I was excited yeah. to see anybody that was in Sopranos, you know, in a movie. So you, right away, I noticed you know your face and kind of saw you in there. So I was excited. Uh, to kind of see you in there, um, but what was what was it like uh, working with Denzel, uh, Josh Brolin? Kind of what was that experience like? Josh Brolin, uh, a very nice man to me. We played partners, so it was yeah. great that he was open and and he was very friendly. He's a real gentleman, uh, and he's a caring actor. And um, I didn't have many lines up top and you know, he told Ridley uh, Bobby should have because you know, they call me Bobby on the set and he should have a few lines it, that line that I had uh, it checks it, it looks like it checks uh, you know that was because Josh said to uh, Ridley he, you know Bobby should have that line and he gave me his line so I mean I remember getting called on the set it wasn't even a day that I was supposed to be on set but really had chosen me. I had just lost my dad, God rest his soul, so that maybe he had something to do in heaven to get that role. Uh, so it was really my first major film role that I had, film film. Ridley Scott, Russell Crowe, Gladiator, you know. I was like, well, holy shit. I, I did that and um, what was I going to say? The first day was great with Josh and I met Ridley very, hello, how are you doing? Hello, hello, how, how are you? <laughs> and I met him, and it was very, he was very friendly. It was, it was a good vibe. I got a good vibe from this. And then the second day uh, my, of work, uh, I had a scene with Josh. We go in to see uh, Denzel. And no, we go to see Richie Roberts, Russell Crowe. We had that scene. He goes into the office and, tell, and he kind of like shakes him down a little bit, you know, and tells him. So I, I, uh, we did one take, and, and, and we did another take, we did another take. And I, I was told to wait outside the office. And, they, and Josh goes in. So I, I asked, this is like my second day, I asked Ridley, I said, Ridley, I said, I think my character would go in with Josh and yeah. I'm his partner. Yeah. And Ridley said, I don't think so. And I said, you're right. 
there, right? I wasn't gonna lose the job because I'm gonna have an argument with Ridley Scott. Man, this is gladiator. This guy. You know, so and it was fine. I mean, but I, you know, you do have to have the courage to to ask in this business. And and if you're gonna be any good, you gotta take risks. If you're gonna be any good, you gotta not care about. This is what I learned from James. Not care so much about being perfect all the time, but to think outside the box a little bit and take some risks. So I took that risk, and, and you know it didn't pay off, but it was a risk. And and then I remember like leaving the set that day and, and getting tapped on the shoulder, and I turn around and it was Russell Crowe introducing himself to me. So all that stuff about Russell Crowe that he's a, you know, all that stuff that they said talked about him in the papers that was so untrue. He's a gentleman. I introduced, he, introduced himself, he introduced himself to me, and I said hi, and we talked a little bit, and he went to the trailer. So it was a great, it was a great experience. That was a really great experience. One thing I regret, too, but uh, is not really getting any chance to talk to Denzel, because we had the same acting teacher. And I could have spoke about what my teacher used to say about him and stuff like that, that he wants to do Shakespeare and everything, all that stuff. He's not that great at it, but I'm not going to only get He's great at Shakespeare. <laughs> He's great at anything he does, Denzel Washington, you know? When you when you talked to uh, to Russell Crowe, did you did you ask him if he was a Sopranos fan? No. Was, was he was he a Sopranos fan at all? Do you know? I don't know. I doubt him. He said hi. How you doing? Weather's fine. Just that's that's stuff like that. You know, I didn't want to put him on the spot. And yeah. It's hard. It's just, it's a fine line. You know, yeah, I love you and Gladiator. It's just it's a fine line. They, I think we all respect each other as actors, our work, and everything. He was you know, so good. Whatever level that you, whatever level that you are, I mean, um, it's just wonderful to be there and to experience the, uh, um, what it's really like. Um, it's nice to uh, what you give and do the best you can with what you got. It's what you do with what you got that counts. So if you get that part that you like and it works out, it's cool. Yeah. He he was so good in uh, American Gangster. I mean, he was he was awesome. That role. It was terrific. Yeah, he was really Richie Raw. His Richie Roberts was really good. Um, I'd hate I'd hate myself if I didn't ask you about uh, the Irishman. Um, okay. Uh, what was what was your experience like on that? Because uh, I mean, I mean, you spent uh, you know the the original scene or that main scene with Robert De Niro. I mean, you were the one that uh, brokered him. Uh, it's a skinny razor. So, I mean, you were, you had a very, very big part, an intricate part in kind of getting him into the, uh, the family at the time. But what was, what was that process like, kind of the audition process and finding yourself on that role? Well, that particular role, that was being used to audition a lot of different actors. Because when I spoke to some actors, they said, well, I auditioned with that role. They had a different, they, they landed a different role. There's all, I forgot what they call it. There's always a role, like in a lot of films, that the uh, directors use as a kind of a, a, a measuring cup, you might say, uh, and see if the actor fits into the cup correctly for the film itself. You know, it could this actor be part of the ingredients of the film? And they use the scene, so that's how they call that. I was reading that once, it's kind of re refresh my memory. But anyway, um, I, was, I was just finishing The Sinner with uh, Jessica Biel. And uh, I was on that. And they were still, they were auditioning for, uh, and Chris Mason who was one of the protagonists on, in, in, the, in the center. Mason, we were talking, he's a great guy, great actor. And uh, we were talking, I said, did you get in for Irishman? He said, nah, did you get in? I said, nah, I said, yeah, it's over, probably it's not gonna happen. I said, yeah, it's probably not gonna happen. Cause we were just finishing up um, that series. And, um, where I played his father, Ron Tonetti. And um, so I didn't think I had a chance to even getting in. Then my manager called me up, it was in September. Um, I got an audition for you, for Irishman. I said, what, are they still casting that? He said, yeah. Why are you still casting it? His process of casting is a very long, detailed process in casting. And I had a friend, I won't mention names, who had auditioned for one of the uh, main roles in, in uh, The Irishman. Uh, prior. So, I mean, I thought it was all over. So when I went in, I saw the role and I read the role. I said, this is pretty good. This, I'm working with Robert De Niro. I introduced him to Skinny Razor. I did some research. I heard you paint houses. I read the book. So my character was in, in, was in the book and I was really pretty cool with that. So I um, 
course, I knew Alan Lewis, the casting director. I knew Marty. And I had a good chance because he likes to keep things in the family. If he works with you once, he'll work with you again because he, like, he likes his people. It's like a lot of directors, old-time Hollywood directors, great directors like to do that. Hitchcock was like that also, from what I understand. Um, William Wyler, uh, uh, John Huston, uh, they're their favorites. You know, they're actors that they like to, to use from time to time. So I landed the role, and uh, the rest is... It was great to work with Robert De Niro. It's so untrue with people. Let's separate politics. He's a genius actor. Uh, this was Taxi Driver. This was Deer Hunter. It was terrific to work with him to see his concentration. And uh, he's a very unique person to work with. You don't have to say a lot. So when he has to say something, he says something. <laughs> you know what I mean? And we hit it off pretty good because we have some mutual friends. Um, Tanya Alder from Deer Hunter, who oh, played yeah. uh, John Savage's wife. Yeah, yeah. She's a dear friend of mine. And also um, Richard Bright, Al Neary from The Godfather. And he was in what he played uh, Chicken Joe in Once Upon a Time in America. Uh, Richie was my mentor. Uh, we lost him um, in 2006 to a bus accident. God rest his soul in New York. Uh, but he mentored me. And uh, it was a great experience to hang out with him and, and listen to his stories, working with Olivier and stuff like that. And so I had, I had some, uh, uh, I could break the ice a bit with uh, Robert De Niro, with Robert. So, and, and I was able to, because as an actor, if, if we're going to be enemies, we don't really have to know each other very well. But if we're going to be friends, it's nice to, have, to break the ice, to have something to talk about. So this way we're simpatico. You know, it's an Italian phrase, you know, for, for friendship or kumba, whatever you want to call it. So that was, and that in itself was a great experience. And of course, um, Morris Scorsese, is, he gets before, great performances from all his actors, extras, background people, because he really makes you feel proud of yourself. You're doing something important that you have, a, you, no matter big or small role you might have, it's important. And I think it truly is. If you look at all the small roles or large roles in that film, uh, Harvey Keitel doesn't have a, a lot of dialogue, but he's, his presence alone is, is there. Um, a lot of the actors, he gets just great work from people because he makes you feel good about yourself. Because a lot of it is a psychological game. If you're feeling uptight and you can't relax people, let's face it, you can't. The painter paints his paintings. He's by himself. He's relaxed. He doesn't have anyone looking at him. You know, there's like 20 people looking at him. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> He's painting by himself. And so Martin Scorsese, he makes you, allows you to paint by yourself because he, he supports you. you know? yeah. All the people around you, from the lighting person to the mic, the wardrobe, all good people, great family, like Sopranos was a great family. We never treated people, uh, there's a lot of hierarchy on certain sets. But we never did that in Sopranos, and you won't see that on a more in Scorsese set either. People are just people like me and you. I wanted, I, I think, uh, just thinking off the I hope top, I answered that I, question okay. Oh, no, that was, that was amazing. That was amazing. I mean, again, that, the Irishman, I had been waiting for it for roughly, it was like, I think it was almost eight years in development, and I had been kind of tracking it during that whole time. I know it originally was supposed to be a different project, The Winter of Frankie Machine. Uh, and then De Niro right. ended up reading the uh, the Irishman book, which is written, um, you know, based on Frank Sheeran, and um, and he gave it to, and he was reading it for research. And then he told Martin, he's, Martin Scorsese, that uh, hey, we actually should should do this. And then that's what it turned into the uh, the actual The Irishman. But what's amazing is that, I mean, De Niro, I mean, he's you know almost eighty years old now. I think he's like 77, 78. He's literally in almost every single scene of the movie. He carries every single scene of the movie. And it's just amazing that, you know, and he, he still is, is doing it, you know, like this, this was one of the closest things that kind of reminded me of like, you know, like you mentioned the taxi driver, the deer hunter. I mean, it's, it's one of those all time uh, classic movies. And in my opinion, for, for Joe Pesci, I, I think this might be his best performance. Um, I mean, this was this was awesome. He was he was great in this movie, and uh, the nomination, the Oscar nominations of how many the the movie got. I mean, just speaks for. Itself. I agree. I'm a little partial to Raging Bull, but uh, great, to great his brother in Raging Bull because he showed he showed some elements there when when the brothers broke up. You know, there were some elements 
that were really human things that you can really recognize. And in this film, Irishman, you, you can recognize also some really great work. Uh, Joe Pett, when, he, when uh, Buffalino is a bit older and he's a little bit more humble and he says, you'll understand. Yeah. And they're in the, uh, the courtyard, you'll understand, you'll understand. It's sad, you know what I mean? It, it, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's a, and I won't say it's a swan song, but I think people are really going to appreciate it. I appreciate it years from now, the, the epic proportion of how it was told. And, and of course the, the intro link with the youth, the youthful thing that, that why they were able to do it, make Robert De Niro look young. And I thought it was a great, and people had to get past that too. So, you know, people had to say, oh, that doesn't, you know, that there was some criticism, but look, it's the content of the story. What it proposes that Jimmy Hoffa was murdered by basically his best friend, which makes so much sense as opposed to these other scenarios, you know? So, I mean, I, I thought, I thought, I believe it to be so, but everyone has their theory of their, their idea of how it happened. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's so many different, uh, you know, that's, that's the million dollar question is, you know, what, what happened to Jimmy Hoffa? And, but you can see yeah. just how it's laid out that this, this could be one way of, uh, of how it happened. But I mean, even movies like Casino, uh, movies like Goodfellas, I mean, they're based on true stories. You know, they're, they're, they're not 100% yes. true. Like even the, uh, the scene where, you know, Joe Pesci and his brother get killed uh, in the uh, cornfield. I mean, that, that didn't happen. I mean, that actually those two brothers were killed uh, in a house. And um, even there were some different, um, you know, fallacies with, with Goodfellas. But yeah, I'm not sure why with, with Jimmy Hoffa, it has to be exactly what happened. Just was it great on scene? Uh, and, and, it, and it was. I mean, it was a phenomenal scene. It was, it was just sad because, you know, you knew that Jimmy Hoffa, you know, Al Pacino, you know, he wouldn't get in the car unless there was someone that he trusted in the car. And um, he had his uh, foster son that was driving, and then it was De Niro. I still don't think he would have gotten in the car with just his foster son. I think it needed to be Frank. Otherwise, he wasn't going to get in. And it was just so sad. He didn't, I agree. He didn't, see it, he didn't see it coming. He didn't see it coming. And I'm sure you noticed this, obviously, because you, you, you know, hooked, you know. Make and the fish, the fish in the front seat. I mean, that was a brilliant... Uh... The fish, the, the smell of fish, I mean, the stink, you know, that, uh, I mean, it was just that, uh, where they, where did Marty Martin got that, or, or Steve Zalian got that one, I thought that was just brilliant, because something, it, there's always something, every masterpiece has a bit of a different shade of color in it that makes it not perfect, yet it, it adds to its uh, beauty, beauty. And that particular scene with that smell, and of course, uh, Frank would not sit in the front. That was great too. You know what I mean? Is it too um, I thought that that hit was a great hit. But as you said, it could have happened differently than that. It doesn't have to happen that way. But to propose that he did it, I think it's pretty valid to me. You know. He did it. Of course, now I think that, well, you know, his loyalty was to Buffalino. I mean, let's face it, he got everything from him, from Buffalino. Not, yeah, he, he climbed the ladder through Jimmy Hoffa. He climbed the ladder through Jimmy Hoffa, but he owed it all to his friend, Philadelphia friend, Buffalino his loyalty. So, I mean, to me, it's, it was valid that, that that's the way it happens usually, you know? If you're gonna get hit, I guess you get hit by your closest person, you know? Yeah, yeah, and I, I agree. I mean, I, I walked away thinking that, again, his, his loyalty was to, uh, was to Russ, and you know, I don't think uh, Martin would have shown the very first scene of the movie um, you know, them meeting up, you know, on the side of the road with, um, you know, Frank's uh, truck stalling and then Russell fixing it for him. And then also, you know, them later on in jail. So, I mean, it was, it was obvious, you know, who the loyalties, um, you know, were, were against. It was a tough decision, but he knew that um, it would have been his life and his family's life if he didn't 
you know, go along with it. Um, but yeah, no, it was, and also too, I'm not sure if you, I'm, I'm sure you do, but uh, the beginning of The Irishman actually starts off with Jimmy Hoffa getting shot. It's about a second, two second scene, right when the movie starts. And I didn't notice that until I rewatched it. And um, it's actually Jimmy, the, Jimmy yeah. getting shot. So you actually see it right in the beginning, but it's so quick that most people don't, uh, don't notice yeah. it on there. Yeah on there but yeah i know definitely i mean that's it's uh interesting it's interesting like like you know like when because if you look at robert de niro's choices like when he kills him he puts the gun on on him he's like that action he's been his friend for so long yet that action of doing that i mean one would think that he would take a second to take a look at him you know and you know like sorry pal you know like I'm, I'm not saying literally say that but there's no regret there he does it like it's his i mean it just goes to show you frank sheeran <laughs> it's brutal man you know i mean these guys are don't look to, don't look back it's just the way it's a code you know, one would think that, you know, you place the gun on him and you think there's some sort of remorse, but there isn't. He puts, he does it. It's very, it's mechanical. It's, it's Robert De Niro in, in Taxi Driver. I mean, it's, it's when he takes care of the uh, Harvey Keitel, you know, I and mean, he just, there's a, there's so, you know, I, at first I said, well, maybe, I don't know. I, maybe I would, I would think. I don't know about that, but then I say it more to myself when I'm talking to you, I'd say, uh, that's the way these guys were. I mean, his loyalty was to Buffalino, and I guess that's the only way to get out of that situation, is once you've done the act, is to leave. Uh, and it's like survival of the fittest. <laughs> You're not gonna sit there and just, you know, sit with the guy, you know? But he gave him a shot, you know? He gave, when he went over to the, I think the lake house or on the phone, we have to talk. He said, you know, it's, it is what it is. It is what it is. He, he did all he could to help him. That was the dialectic of the whole thing too, that alternating current. Zaya, you know, Zaya, Zaya, you know? Yeah. Everybody gave him a shot. He did what he could. Yeah, everybody yeah. was giving him a shot. I mean, that scene he gave was a shot. Just His bullheaded arrogance and pride, you know? Yeah, that. That scene he forgot. Was he forgot. He forgot who, how he got there. You know, he forgot. He got to. Uh, I mean, that's what uh, Marty was able to prove. I think yeah. that he, he made a good case for that. That Hoffa really had that. And the more you watch Pacino, the more you're gonna like his performance. I'm telling you. And I know you like it, but the more I watch him in that, the more I like his performance. I want to watch it again now after talking to you. I want to watch him again. He's so great. Um, I'm going to watch it again. Um, I've, I've read the book, and you know, the book is, is just as good as well. Um, but the movie itself, I've, I've actually seen it well over 10 times, maybe even closer to 20 times. And it's one of yeah. those movies, just like The Godfather, the second it goes on, you can't stop it. You can't pause it. You just, you're, you're done for three hours, three and a half hours, you're, you're watching it. Um, so, no, definitely. I mean, that's, that's, first of all, amazing to, you know, see you in the Irishman and obviously seeing the, uh, the rest of the cast and, um, you know, just another magnificent uh, piece of work. Um, Robert, I did want to also ask, you know, what are, what are some of your uh, upcoming projects that you're working on? Are you working on any new uh, TV series or any upcoming movies that? I've been auditioning for, a, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that the, is that, yes, I, I, is that, I'm happy that the business is starting to reopen here in New York. Uh, Blue Bloods is shooting. I had an audition for Blue Bloods. I, won't, I can't really talk about what I auditioned for, but another one for The Godfather of Harlem. So I'm starting to pick up the auditions of picking up. Um, I have some personal projects that I'm working on. One is called uh, Paulie Walnuts is My Barber, but it's not about Paulie Walnuts. It's a play uh, written by Frank Petrelli with a good friend of mine, Gordon Silver, and Emily Denova. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of great actors, John Frieder. Um, um, and myself and, and uh, it's uh, Ernie Mangione and it, it, it's a play about a uh, relationship a young girl who's perhaps had a relationship with an older man and she sticks around and he's grown to love her but 
she needs to move on. And I'll let you know that's going to be a Zoom event. So we're going to try to produce that um, uh, when the theater gets going or maybe do a teleplay of it. So that's one I'm doing. Um, another play with Renegade Nation, Theater of the Theater Nation with Maureen Van Zandt, Steven, Steven Van Zandt, uh, Maureen Van Zandt from The Sopranos. Yep. Um, um, uh, with her, we're doing a, a Closer, an English play. We're doing a, a Zoom event. Uh, it's been, it was pre-taped already and they're putting it together like a, like a film, but only, you know, pre-taped. So that's for the Renegade Theater Nation. That could be, uh, be uh, I'll, I'll air it on my, uh, my uh, Facebook page. I'll give you the information. Yeah, I'll, share. That. I'll share it. I'll yeah, share it. Yeah. Yeah. Good share it. And so these are small things, small personal projects. Um, besides cooking. Oh yeah. Don't say some personal things. I, I have some personal things I want to talk about, but uh, I, you know, I mean, I have a project that I, I wrote that uh, it's called Ghost Mafia, and I think it's really a great, a fun, a fun comedy. Oh, nice! And uh, so I'm trying to get that uh, maybe produced, you know. So, but I don't want to give the idea out to anybody, so I'm not going to tell you what it's about. Wise guys and the young kind of Chris Hart, you know, from you know Chris Hart. Yeah, meet some wise guys. He meets some wise guys, but they're dead wise guys. <laughs> That's actually <laughs> they want to live. <laughs> That's a great idea. It's a great idea. That uh, yeah. We'll... So you know, I mean, I got I got that. It's just so hard, you know. Now I want to shop that around, maybe to you know see what I can do with that. Be a little bit more aggressive with trying to get that out. You know, I co-wrote that with a, a writer, Larry Garver. So I have some projects. I think that. Um, the way is in trying to produce your own stuff, getting involved, very much like what Sylvester Stallone did, but maybe uh, kind of steering towards uh, getting involved with some people or a community of people that you, they could produce stuff for like Netflix or stuff like that. You know what I mean? So, I mean, yeah. Well, that's, that's awesome. No, I, every, every single project that you mentioned, um, you know, definitely sounds interesting. I can't wait to, to see, uh, you know, some of those personal projects and hopefully you can get that, that, my movie written as well um yeah you know, anything that i can do to to share i mean I'd, I'd love to do that um yeah i'd love to see you also in, in more of these types of roles and you mentioned the uh, the godfather of harlem it's funny when i when i watched uh that show um because they haven't they haven't uh, aired season two yet right it's still i'm not sure not yet so yeah i i for some your your face kind of came into mine i was like i'd love to see you in uh, in godfather of, of harlem um, and a few other Sopranos guys came to my head, but you specifically, I was like, you'd be really, really good uh, in this show. Um, so that'd we'll be see, you know, we'll see. Yeah, awesome. Well, um, I do want to sign off on that. I can, again, I can talk to you for, for hours. I mean, you're one of my favorite actors. That's all right. Everything that you yeah. do. Thank one you. Thing that I do Thank have to you. say is don't stop cooking and posting your, uh, your music. <laughs> make my mouth uh, water. And, uh, if you, Thank you uh, for doing this, man. If you DoorDash your food, let me know. I'll be your uh, your customer. <laughs> okay. Thank you very you much. Take care. Robert. Thank you for the opportunity, love to do this man. Thing time. Thank you very much. Right on, man. Let's keep in touch. I will absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay. Take care. You take care, brother. Bye.